Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis using the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net. If you're on YouTube, you can also press the dollar sign to send a donation via Super Thanks. And you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Now it is time for this week's episode of Dangerous Assignment. The original air date is May the 4th, 1951, and the title is Find Rudolph Carpell. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to wind up with my catching a war criminal because a china shop vanishes into thin air. Morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you had an assignment for me. I do, Steve. Ever hear of Gluten No. Sounds like something you spread on rye bread. You're not even close. It's a woman's track team. Oh, uh, well, hey, you know, for a moment I thought you said... That's a... just what I did say. The Gluten Schweitzen girls are an amateur track team who travel around Europe. Gluten Schweitzen yet? <laughs> Where did they ever pick up a handle like that? Mrs. Gluten used to be quite a track star herself. She went over to one of the Olympics from St. Paul. And as the story goes, she pole vaulted into the lap of her future husband, Mr. Gluten. How enchanting, huh? Anyway, she married Gluten and never came back to the States. Gluten has a lot of money, pretzels or something, so she started sponsoring this track team. So that explains the Gluten. Where does the Schweitzen come in? He's the coach. Oh, I see. Well, Commissioner, I think it's just dandy of you to send for me so that you could give me all this real fascinating information, but would you mind telling me what it's all got to do with me if you think I'm going to challenge any of those Amazons to a potato race? Steve, or... I'm sure you remember the name Carpell. Rudolph Carpell? That's right. One of the most vicious war criminals there was. His concentration camp was a nightmare of brutality. Yeah, I remember. Nobody was ever quite sure whether Carpell was dead or alive. We're sure now. Is that he's dead? That he's alive. Mm. That's where the Gluten Schweitzen girls come in, Steve. One of them, a girl named Martha, saw Carpell in Rotterdam, Holland, two days ago. Look, Commissioner, we've had a few similar reports like this in the past, as I remember, and each time it turned out to be a false alarm. I know, but this girl, Martha, swears she really saw Carpell, and apparently she knows what she's talking about. How so? Her father and Carpell used to be in business together before the war. I see. Well, that sort of throws a new light on it, huh? Yes, I think we're really on Carpell's trail at last. Rotterdam Holland, huh? Yes. The uh, Gluten Schweitzen girls are training at a stadium there. Get over there, Steve. Talk to this Martha. Talk to Mrs. Gluten. Talk to Schweitzen if you want to. But above all, find Rudolf Carpell. Well, that's it. You got your assignment? Good luck. National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. To all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment. Go over to Holland and get a lady track star to put the finger on a war criminal named Rudolf Carpell, whom we've been chasing for six years, all of which gives me an uneasy feeling that before the deal's over, I'll find myself in a track meet, that somebody will be putting a shot at my direction with a gun. 
It's Tuesday when my plane lands in Rotterdam, and I head for the stadium, and there in all their glory are the gluten Schweitzen girls. Some of them doing calisthenics, others charging around the track, and out in the center of the field stands a beefy woman with a sweatshirt and a whistle and a megaphone. Hey, <laughs> Which, with her voice, is strictly excess baggage. Hilda! The knee's up! Higher! Higher! Uh, excuse me, are you Mrs. Gluten? Yeah, Ingeborg! No, no, Steve Mitchell from the States. Yeah, Ingeborg, longer strides take. Oh, uh, you mean the girl coming around the track? Yeah, my best 400 meter runner. What do you know? Here, I introduce you. Yes. Ingeborg, this is Mr. Mitchell. Happy to meet you. Hi, I mean, uh, Hi. Well, that was undoubtedly the shortest acquaintance on record. <sighs> she has good form, that Ingeborg. Yeah, speaking for form, who's that little number over there? Oh, that is Frida. Very nice. What's her specialty? Broad jump. Uh-huh. Anna! Hips! Hips! Yeah, she sure has... Uh, uh, Mrs. Gluten, I came over here to question one of your girls. Her name is Martha. Yeah, yeah, that is Martha. The exercise is doing. <laughs> Martha! Brother, you take no chances of not being heard, do you? You should hear me with the megaphone. I'm sorry I asked. What is it, Mrs. Gluten? Now, this is Steve Mitchell. He has questions. Oh, yes, Mr. Mitchell. They told me to expect you. Well, I go now. Okay, thanks, Mrs. Gluten. In the box! Let the arms loosely swing! Uh, Martha, one, two, one, as I two, understand one, it, two. you think you saw a man named Rudolph... Carpell here in Rotterdam? I am positive of it, Mr. Mitchell. You see, he and my father used to be in business together back before the war. Mm -hmm. That was 14 years ago, and I was only a little girl, but I have always remembered his face, like a weasel. Where did you see him? I was shopping the day before yesterday. Late in the afternoon, I reached a chinaware shop named Spears. Mm -hmm. I went inside, and there behind the counter was Carpell. Did he see you? I do not know, but I doubt it. He was waiting on some other customers at the time. I see. Okay, Martha, I'd like you to take me to that shop so I can arrange for Carpell to retire from the Chinaware business for keeps. The shop is just a few doors farther down the street, Mr. Major. Uh, what did you say the name of it is? Spears. Okay. Now, look, all you have to do is point him out to me through the window. Then you better get out of the line of fire just in Mr. case... Mr. Mitchell. He... Hmm? What's the matter? This is the place. Oh, okay. Now, just... Hey, wait a minute. I thought you said a china shop named Spears was supposed to be here. Yes. That is the trouble. This is a bakery shop instead. Look, are you sure this is the right location? Oh, but of course. Maybe we're on the wrong street. No. Mr. Mitchell, this is the place. I am positive of it. Yeah, well, a lot of chinaware got transferred into a lot of pies all of a sudden. Wait a minute. How long ago was it that you saw Carpell? The day before yesterday. Mm, maybe he did spot you and pulled the switch here. You mean change the entire shop? Sounds like a lot of trouble to go to, doesn't it? Well, come on, let's see what we can find out inside. All right. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Come on. You uh, sound pretty sure of it. Some nice stroll this morning? No, no, no. Some information, please. Uh, inf, inf, inf. This is pastry, yeah? <laughs> Look, how long have you been here, Buster? Uh, bo Buster? No, no, no. Otto, Otto. Okay, Otto, then. I'm here all morning baking strudel. I mean before this morning. Ah, uh, let me see. Uh, Mama and I, we came here when Karen was three and Hans, he, he was six. Now, uh, Karen, Look, she skip is, the uh, family history, uh, will you? Uh, 23 years. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty-three years making strudel. Look, Martha, you must have the wrong place. I would swear this is the place, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, yeah, it is the place for strudel, yeah, yeah. Come on, let's get outside. Uh, uh, come again when you can't spend so much. Happy strudel to you, too. I can't understand it, Mr. Mitchell. Neither can I. Look, Martha, isn't it possible you got mixed up about the location of this Spears Chinaware shop? Well, I suppose I must have them. Yet I was so sure. Wait a minute. This guy with the push cart. Maybe this is his regular beat. Hey, uh, just a minute, mister. Yeah, my dear, yeah, yeah. Candies, sweet meat, sugar plants. Uh, look, is this your regular beat? Be beat? Beat? To, what, what is this beat? You push your cart around this part of town often? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every day. Good. Uh, it is. Yeah. yeah. You see that bakery shop a couple of doors down the street? Yeah, yeah. How long has it been there? Well, uh, I, I don't know. You don't, huh? Steve. 
Maybe. Yeah. Hey, you see, I don't know how long is the bakery shop there because I have only had this cart for five years. For, for, you mean the bakery shop was there when you started pushing this cart? Oh, yeah, yeah. And that strudel that they make there, you would not believe. Look, I know all about the strudel. Come on, Martha. I'm sorry, Steve. I don't know what to say. I wonder. Hmm? I was just thinking, Martha, it was very convenient of the gent with a push cart to come by just now. You think he lied? I don't know, but that's what we're going to find out right now. Come on. We check the shops up and down the street, but all the shopkeepers agree that the bakery's been there as long as they can remember. Finally, we work our way to a jewelry store at the end of the street, and we question the proprietor and get the same answer. Otto's Bakery Shop? Why, well, it's been on the street as long as I can remember. In that same location, halfway down the block on the west side? Yeah. All right, Steve. I obviously am wrong about the street. But the Chinaware shop must be right around here somewhere. Perhaps in the next block. You, said. perhaps you could tell us. Chinaware shop? The name of it is Spears. Spears? I... No, I've never heard of it. You sure? Quite sure. Steve. Yes, Martha. I am quite convinced at this point that I am crazy. Look, Martha, Rotterdam isn't your hometown, is it? No, why? Well, maybe being a stranger in town, you got more mixed up than you think. Maybe this Spears is in a different part of the town altogether. And maybe there is no Spears at all. Now, look... You are uh... being very kind about it, Steve. But I know what you are thinking. Here is a girl who claims to have seen a dangerous man. So a government agent goes with her, expecting her to lead him straight to that man. But suddenly she cannot. She is all mixed up. Yes, it sounds as if I had imagined the whole thing, doesn't it? Uh, will there be anything else, sir? Oh, uh, no, thanks. Oh, thank you for your trouble. We are sorry to have bothered you. That is quite all right. But now, Steve? Oh, look around a few more streets, I guess. Steve, all I can say to you is this. Somewhere in this city, I saw Rudolf Carpel. I thought I knew the name and location of the shop. I appeared to be wrong about both. But please believe me. I did see him. And I will not rest until I can remember where and lead you to him. Yeah, yeah, sure. Come on, Martha. I'll take you back to your hotel. Thank you for seeing me into the lobby, Steve. Sure. Sure. I'm going up to my room now and rack my brain until I can remember. I will call you as soon as I do. Okay, Martha. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Mitchell. Brother, talk about pear-shaped tones. Alligator pear. Uh, did you find out what you wanted from Martha? Not exactly. Look, Mrs. Gluten, what kind of a girl is Martha? Well, all my girls is good girls, Mr. Mitchell. That's not what I mean. What I'm wondering right now is whether Martha could have imagined the whole thing. Well, maybe you got something there. What do you mean? Well, this Martha, she is the flighty one of the team. Oh? Yeah, uh, last year she had her engagement organ. And since then she is not so happy and keeps to herself. Yeah, I, I would say she could have imagined. Hey, hang on! What's this? Explosion! Sounded like it came from upstairs. Come on! Uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell? Huh? Your form, it is very good. What? But if you swing the arms more and stride lengthen... Look, coach, this is no time for a running lesson. I don't see no... Wait, around this corner. Hey, look at that. The door to that room blown right off its hinges. Yeah, there are flames coming up. Mr. Mitchell, that is Martha's room. What? Yeah, Martha, she must be in there. Quick, turn in the alarm. I'll see what I can do with that fire extinguisher on the wall. But I can't make it enough of a dent in the flames to get into the room. I just about hold my own for ten minutes or so, and then the firemen arrive and go to work. Finally, they get the fire enough under control so they can work their way into the room. Mrs. Gluten and I wait outside in the uh, hall. Mr. Mitchell, anyone in that room, uh, there would not be much left of them. I'm afraid you're right, Mrs. Gluten. Yeah, look. Out they come with the stretcher. Oh, Martha, Martha. <laughs> well, she sure wasn't just imagining she saw Rudolf Carpell. That's a cinch, but it's also a cinch she'll never be able to lead me to him now. Three 
chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and fun for you tomorrow evening here on NBC. For music, hear the premier broadcast of a refreshing new series called Musical Merry-Go-Round, bringing a melodic blend of classical and popular music. And for laughs tomorrow, hear Monty Woolley as he stars in The Magnificent Montague, formerly heard on Fridays, now brought to you as a Saturday night feature. Remember, tomorrow evening, it's Musical Merry-Go-Round and The Magnificent Montague. Now back to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Poor Marta. Yeah. If she could only have remembered where she spotted Carpell before he rigged this booby trap for her. Booby trap? Yeah, he must have had some sort of a bomb rigged here in the room. So that when she opened the door, it exploded. Yeah, you know, funny... Oh, what is? She left me in the lobby at least ten minutes before the explosion... Took her a long time to get to her room. Uh, this carpel. Where will you look for him now? Oh, search me. Martha was my only lead. Well, What's come on, let's... What happened? Martha! Well, uh, uh, you are alive. My room, what happened? That's what I'd like to know. Apparently, your room was booby-trapped, Martha. We figured you were the one that they carried out on the stretcher. But I did not go to my room after I left you in the lobby. Oh? No, I decided to walk around some more and see if I could remember about Carpel. So I did not even take off my coat. I went downstairs and out. Then who got booby-trapped in your room? I don't know. Well, uh, perhaps it was uh, one of the other girls. They visit back and forth a lot. I can quickly find out. Wait a minute. What is it? Chances are that the killer hung around the hotel long enough to see how his trap worked. Yeah, perhaps. If so, he could have seen you enter the hotel after the explosion, Martha. With that red raincoat you're wearing, you'd be easy to spot. What are you getting at? Maybe she's still around somewhere. If there were only some way we could trap him, uh, make him think... I got it, Mr. Mitchell. Huh? Uh, This red raincoat of Martha's. I could squeeze into it. But why? I will go outside, and maybe in the dark, the killer will think I am Martha. He will follow me, and then you can follow him. I don't know. It might be pretty dangerous for you, Mrs. Gluten. Mr. Mitchell, I am no weakling. Well, that I believe, but still... Hey, wait. What is it? I think I've figured out a way to do it without any risk to either of you. Oh, I will do anything to help, Mr. Mitchell. You don't have to do a thing, Martha, except stay in a safe place. Mrs. Gluten's suite, for instance. Well, all right. But what are you going to do? Give Mrs. Gluten your raincoat. She and I are going for a ride. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, I don't understand you. I put on the raincoat. We get into the car and drive here to the edge of the city. And now you keep craning your neck around. Yeah, to see if we're being followed. Well, are we? I'm not sure... Hey, here we are. Yeah, uh, here we are, there. See that little hotel right there? Uh, well, what about it? That's as good as place as any. Come on. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, uh, perhaps you'd be good enough to tell me what is which. Look, you're wearing Martha's red raincoat. Yeah, yeah. From a distance, you could pass as Martha. Sure, sure, sure. All that we have figured out already. But Now, what I... suppose Carpell is following us. He sees us go into the hotel, and in a minute, I come out alone. Ah, he thinks you have hidden Martha here. That's right. I drive off, double back, and if he tries for the hotel, I grab him. Well, what do you want I should do? Slip out the back door, grab a cab back to your hotel and wait for me. And above all, don't let anything happen to Martha. (laughs) Mrs. Gluten eases out the back door. I wait a few minutes and then go out the front. I get in the car and drive off. Around the corner, I park, get out, and work my way back to a spot in the shadows of the alley across the street from the hotel. Then I wait. Fifteen minutes later, I see a gent approaching the hotel very cautiously. He could be my boy. He gets to the entrance and takes a quick look around, then slips inside. I'm just about to go after him when suddenly there's a faint sound behind me in the alley. I start to turn around, but something very solid connects with the back of my head, and I take a dive. When I come out of it, I'm all alone. I don't get it. If the guy entering the hotel was Carpel, then who slugged me and why? I cross the street and check the hotel, but of course the guy is gone, so I head back to Mrs. Gluten's hotel suite. Oh, Mr. Mitchell, come in. Thanks. Oh, my, your head. You got a lump? Lump, yeah. I'll sell it a loss, believe me. Who did that? I don't know, incidentally. Did you come right back here after you went out that back door? Oh, yeah, sure, why? 
I'm just wondering. Where is Marta? What? I said, where is Marta? That's just what I was afraid. You said I thought she was here with you. Well, she was, but now I thought she was with you. What do you mean? I came right back here like you told me. Marta was just leaving. She said you had just telephoned her. What? Yeah, yeah. She said you told her the plans had been changed, that you wanted her to meet you at a certain place. Oh, great. So why isn't she with you? Because I'm not the guy who telephoned her. What? Then who did? Oh, three guesses. Aye, Capel. Look, did Martha say where this phony meeting place was supposed to be? Yeah, 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 she did. Now, let me think a minute. Right, 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 right. Come on, come oh, on, think. Yeah, yeah, wait now. Ah, I got it. The west entrance to Vandel Park. Okay, I'll see you later. Yeah. I head for the park entrance fast, but when I pull up and see the crowd gathered there, I figure I'm a few minutes too late. I expect to see Martha's body in the midst of them, but as it turns out, I'm wrong. Two guys have locked bumpers and are busily haranguing each other, much to the enjoyment of the crowd standing around. At first, I'm relieved, but when I look through the crowd, Martha isn't there. I ask a few people if they remember seeing her, but they tell me that the quarrel's been going on about a half an hour and they haven't been paying any attention to anything else, so it looks like Carpell has finally gotten to Martha and shut her mouth. I drive back to the hotel and head for my room. Hello, Steve. Well, but... Martha! Yes, I... Hey, are you okay? Uh-huh. Oh, brother, that's a relief. You know, I'm going to quit worrying about you. First, I think you've been blown up in your hotel room, but you come walking down the hall a few minutes later. Just now I figure Carpell's finally gotten to you, but you show up in my room safe and sound. I'm oh. glad you were wrong both times. Oh, so am I. But what happened? Well, I went to the meeting place I thought you had told me about over the telephone. But on the way, I began wondering about the call. Wondering whether it really had been you. Then the street was deserted and I became frightened, so I left. I see. When I got back to Mrs. Gluten's suite, she told me you had not been the one who telephoned me. Uh, lucky you left when you did then. Yes. Come on, Martha, I'll take you back to Mrs. Gluten's suite. All right. Steve, hmm. do you think that it was Carpel who called and disguised his voice? Well, he'd be the logical one, wouldn't he? Yes. That means he definitely did see me the other day in that Chinaware shop. Yeah, it looks that way. Well, here we are. Ah! Come on in. So, the two of you finally got together safely. From now on, we must keep an eye on this young one. Yeah, might be a good idea if you get some rest, Martha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go into my bedroom and make yourself at home. Thank you. I oh, think no. I will. I am rather worn out. Yes, yes. Well, Mr. Mitchell, what now? Did you find out who the girl was who died in Martha's hotel room, Mrs. Gooden? Oh, yeah, it was Frieda. Poor thing. I guess she went into Wisseton, thinking Martha was there. Okay, I'm going to make a telephone call. Telephone call? What about? Not so loud. Well, what is the secret? Who are you going to telephone? The morgue. <laughs> So I make my call and tell them what I want to know. Half an hour later, they call me back, and what they tell me doesn't surprise me at all. Well? They just finished the autopsy on Frida. She was stabbed to death. Stabbed? You mean Carpel killed the wrong girl and then rigged up the explosion to make... No, no, I don't mean that at all, Mrs. Huh? Gluten. Come on. I want to have a little talk with our little Martha. Martha? But what has she got to do with it? That's just what I want her to tell me. Hey, she's gone. Yeah, look, the window, it's open. Yeah, an extension phone beside the bed. She probably overheard what the morgue told me. I still don't understand what Wait, it is. Wait, fire escape outside. Yeah, there she is down on the street hailing a taxi. Come on, let's get down on your, to the car fast. <laughs> Yeah, I saw her jump out of that taxi cab when it flew down near the canal here. Yeah, I thought so too, but where'd she go? She is a good swimmer. Maybe she went... Wait a minute. See that barge tied up on the bank over there? You think she could be hiding on it? It's the only cover I can see for quite a way. Slow down. All right. Okay. What are you doing? I'm getting out here. Huh? I'll check the barge. You continue along the canal away, and if you don't spot her, come back here to the barge. <laughs> I jump out, hit the ground, and roll to my feet. Every second counts now. I jump aboard the barge. Looks deserted. There are no lights. I 
start walking towards a small deck house at the stern. Then, as I get to it and turn the corner, I spot a glint of metal. I drop to one knee and a fire axe buries itself in the bulkhead behind me. Close, but no cigar, Martha. Let go of me. Stay put. Let go. I said stay put. Oh, why, you... That's better. I should have cracked open your head when I had the chance. You mean in front of that other hotel when I was waiting for Carpell to show up? Yeah. You sure didn't want me to grab him then, did you? What? You... You know about that? Yeah. I think I finally got you pegged. You see, I caught you in one lie, so I figured maybe you'd lied about a few other things looking back on the deal in that light. A lot of things fell into place. What lie are you talking about? You told me you got a phone message from me setting up a meeting place. You said you went there and it was deserted. That's what tripped you up because there'd been a traffic accident there and a crowd had gathered. All right, all right. But you cannot prove a thing. You rigged that story about a fake phone call as an excuse for you to get out of Mrs. Gluten's suite. You knew I had a plan to trap Carpell, and you were afraid it would work. That's why you slugged me when I was closing in on him. No, that is not true. What's your angle, Martha? Blackmail? I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry, your eyes just gave you away. Sure, it all fits. You spot Carpell here in Rotterdam and try to blackmail him, but he won't pay, so you get me over here to protect you and to show him you mean business. Then you take me on a wild goose chase around town pretending you're looking for him. Yes, just been quite clever. What? Carpell! You both move almost too fast for me. It was with difficulty that I followed the chase here from the hotel. Ah, stand quite still, both of you. Hey, I remember you. But of course. Martha brought you into my jewelry store yesterday to inquire about a mythical china shop. Pretty smart, Martha, parading me in front of Carpell to let him know that you could blow the whistle on him any time you wanted. As I say, Martha's a clever girl of us. Carpell, listen to me. Martha, one thing I don't get is why you killed that other girl, Frida. Frida, did you say? Yeah. Oh, I believe I can explain that. Oh? You see, after your visit to my jewelry store, I realized I was powerless that I must pay Martha to blackmail. So I telephoned her hotel room to tell her. As I was talking, I heard her suddenly exclaim, Frida, as if someone had just come into the room. I get it now. Frida heard you talking to Carpell. You killed her to shut her mouth and then rigged an explosion to make it look like Carpell had tried to kill you. Carpell, you must listen. I will not blackmail you anymore, I promise. I know. What do you mean? Simply that if I kill both of you, I will be quite safe again. No! I'm afraid you're a little too late, Carpell. What do you mean? I notified the Rotterdam police. There's a car coming toward us along the canal bank. It should be them. You're bluffing. No. No, I see the headlights. I hear it, too. What? Thanks for turning your head. Too late. (laughs) Oh, no, Martha. You're not going anywhere. Mr. Mitchell. Here on the barge, Mrs. Gluten. And Martha's with me. I did as you said. Then down to the end of the canal and come back. I'm glad you did. I just passed you off as the Rotterdam police. As for you, Martha, you have disgraced the gluten strikes and girls. You are the rotten apple in our cake. You will turn on your sweat suit at once. Yeah, I don't imagine she'll be doing much running from now on as far as disgracing the gluten Schweitz and girls, though I'm sure you and the rest of your team will live that down, Mrs. Gluten. Incidentally, there's one thing that's been puzzling me all through this deal. Yes, oh, Your does... team is called the gluten Schweitz and girls, right? Right. The commissioner told me that the Schweitz came from the name of the coach. Hey, yeah, but... But when I got here, I find you coaching the girls. Well, yeah. So where's Schweitz well, uh, could you keep a secret? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, there is no Schweitzen. Mrs. Gluten. Confidentially. Who could marry a man with a name like that? Three chimes mean good times on NBC. On the big show this Sunday, you'll hear Margaret Truman, Fred Allen, Groucho Marx, Ginger Rogers, and many more. Plus, the glamorous and dynamic Tallulah. No wonder it's the big show. And remember, it's a radio first for Theater Guild on the air Sunday as Catherine Cornell makes her radio dramatic debut in the first radio presentation of Shaw's Candida. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and is produced and directed by Bill Karn. 
Others in the cast were Martha Wentworth, Tony Barrett, Virginia Gregg, Sidney Miller, and Barney Phillips. Join us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another dangerous assignment. Dangerous Assignment came to you from Hollywood. Next, enjoy The Man Called X and your hit parade on NBC tonight. Welcome back. So, let's just get this straight. She married a man named Mr. Gluten, who owned a pretzel factory. Who were her other suitors? Mr. Protein, who owned a meat processing company. Or Mr. Dairy, who owned a brand of cheese. Also, it feels like some wires got crossed because at the start of the story, the commissioner says that Mrs. Gluten went over to the Olympics from St. Paul. So she was in St. Paul. There was not a St. Paul Olympics, but she went over to the Olympics and met Mr. Gluten and never came back to the States. The way that Marsha Wentworth plays her with this big German accent seems a bit much. But actually, uh, despite the fact it not making sense in the context of the story, uh, Marsha Wentworth's so fun in this role that I barely care about the disconnect between her performance and the way she's supposed to be in the script. That plus I think this was a really uh, clever setup because that whole china shop thing was a red herring and I spent probably way too much time wondering what was going on with the china shop. Was there some big conspiracy or was someone being threatened? And this is the type of thing that if I were a sleuth, I would get bogged down endlessly in this sort of situation. But I think Steve's sort of bottom line thinking is, it's not there. So if it's not there, what's the explanation? And that's where his mind went, and he came up with a good solution and used one of his standard Steve Mitchell moves to get out of the situation. So... Uh, I thought this was a really solid story, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. Listener comments and feedback now. And we have an email from Richard who writes, Hello, Adam. I hope you and the family are enjoying a wonderful summer. I enjoy seeing the pictures that you post on Instagram. I wanted to share an observation about Dangerous Assignment that always makes me laugh. Towards the beginning of each episode, Steve will meet someone that he does not recognize, and this person usually has a hostile-slash-aggressive attitude towards it. The person will then identify themselves as someone like Sergeant Gumby from the French police. Steve then instantly hands over his secret agent credentials without asking for any from this unknown individual. You would think secret agent training would include something like establishing someone's identity before you hand over yours. Uh, those were certainly simpler times back then, apparently. All the best from Massachusetts, the land of mosquitoes this summer. Well, sorry about the mosquitoes, Richard. And Richard, I think you raise an interesting point. Now, part of this is just the type of person that Steve is. Steve is a very intuitive, guts-driven individual. And so if you tell him that you're Sergeant Gumby, and he thinks about it and says, you know, if he is Sergeant Gumby, then all of his behavior heretofore makes sense. And I think I believe him, and I think we can work together. In addition to that, photos were not as prevalent on identification cards as they are today. In many television programs and movies of this era, the plot point of someone just being able to grab an identification card and 
impersonate the holder, even if they look entirely different, was used multiple times and with good reason. The requirement of pictures on ID cards was just not there for the most part. It wasn't until 1958 that California, for example, began to require photos on driver's licenses. And it's safe to say that in most of the countries Steve has visited, particularly those that were either uh, third world countries to start with or had been touched by war, probably didn't have photos as well, which would have made any credentials fairly easy to fake. So I don't think Steve could rely on the credentials because someone who would lie about being a police sergeant would likely have forged credentials in place already to support that lie. So ultimately, it comes back to his instincts. Now, should he ask for credentials to back up those instincts, even though those credentials could theoretically be forged? Yes, but I can understand why he doesn't. Now, for those of you who don't follow us on Instagram, the pictures he referenced are generally pictures of things that I see out and about, which I post in addition to the audiograms. Most of it is not show-related. I tend to use the Instagram Stories feature. I never thought the feature was useful when I heard about it, but it allows those who are kind of curious about getting a little glimpse of our world here in Idaho. And mostly it's parks and animals, that sort of thing. And my own dog and cat have popped up a couple of times. We don't really do people, but there's a lot of great natural stuff to see. And occasionally we'll take in something inside. Uh, recently, we went to the Discovery Center here in Boise, and I took a lot of pictures in there. They had this really massive Star Wars collection on display. And I'm not a Star Wars super fan, but I do love the original films, and I like some of the stuff that's come since then. And so I took a few pictures, posted them on my story, and that's nice because people who are really curious can see, but somebody you know, cruising over to Instagram to look at all the posts, they see pretty much audiograms and show-related stuff. So there's no big Star Wars post in my history. But again, thanks so much for the lovely email, Richard. Truly appreciated. Now it is time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Gretchen, Patreon supporter since September 2017, currently supporting the program at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, Gretchen. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you're listening to the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and do all those great things such as commenting that help the channel to grow. We will be back next Wednesday with another episode of Dangerous Assignment coming next Saturday. We'll have some previously uncirculated episodes of Indictment, but join us back here tomorrow for Follow Vance, where... Well, Vance, that's the end of the round. It's a good fight. Glad you came. Definitely, Marker. I don't think our boy's going to last, though. Joey Martin, I still think he'll win. The other fellow's tired. He's tired of hitting Joey's chin so often. <laughs> Incidentally, even though you are a district attorney, you don't have too much drag in this town. I've been in better seats. The fight was a sellout, and you didn't make up your mind about coming until the last moment. Besides, there wasn't any law against your trying to get the tickets. There most certainly was. A law I wrote and passed myself. <laughs> if I'd tried to get them, we'd be at home listening to this over the radio. I'll tell you something, Markham. In which event, I'll listen. Thank you. What I was about to say was that the managers really do a good job working over their fighters between rounds. Look at them over there. They're certainly active, all right. Well, there's the warning buzzer, Vance. Ten seconds to the next round. Yes, I know. What? A shot, Vance. Came from the back of the arena. It's all right, folks. Keep your seats. Nobody's been hurt. Well, I'm glad of that. I wonder why. Help! Help somebody over here at ringside! A man's been stabbed! A shot fired in the back of the arena. A man stabbed at ringside. Come on, Vance. Let's find out what this is all about. It's a long way to the ringside. Excuse me. Pardon me, Vance. Your attention, through, please. please, ladies and gentlemen. Wait a minute, Markham. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep your seats until the police arrive. 
Pop Manning, Joey Martin's manager, has been stabbed to death. Stabbed to death. Nobody is to leave this arena. Lance, you have a fight and a mystery all in one evening. I suppose you'll start work right now on finding out who killed Pop Manning. I'm going to do twice as much work on that, Markham. I'm going to have to find the two people who were responsible for his death. Two? Yes, Markham, two. Don't you understand why? I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.